Now, there are limitations to the situations to which Poisseur's formula can be applied. Poisseur's flow is not valid at the entry to the tube before the flow has become laminar and steady. That's because at, at the beginning of the tube, uh, the flow takes a little while to become fully developed. And so you, in this uh, entrance uh, condition, is a function of x as well as y. And this is a consequence of uh, effects at the boundaries, known as boundary layer effects. Another situation where Poisseur flow is not valid is when the velocity and diameters are high enough to produce turbulence. Reynolds, in the 19th century, did experiments trying to figure out at what flow conditions a laminar flow would become turbulent. And he discovered a parameter called the Reynolds number, which is dimensionless, where uh, the transition to turbulence would occur when this parameter was something in excess of 2,000, depending on, on other factors like the smoothness of the wall of the, of the tube. So the Reynolds number is defined as rho u d over mu. And this is a dimensionless quantity. Rho is the density. U is the characteristic velocity. D is the characteristic dimension, so the diameter of the tube in a tube flow. And mu is the viscosity. And this dimensionless number, as it gets larger, turbulence becomes more likely. And the point at which turbulence occurs is called the transitional Reynolds number. And in the circulation, uh, the Reynolds number varies from uh, 10, under 10 to the minus 3 to over 1,000. And there are some parts in the circulation where it exceeds 2,000. And 2,300 is the transitional Reynolds number for blood flow. So uh, in the heart and around the heart valves, the Reynolds number does exceed or can exceed 2,000. And it's possible to get turbulent flows there. So just to see what the Reynolds number means, it's useful to go back and look at the terms of the Navier-Stokes equations and to look at their dimensions. So if we let capital U be the characteristic velocity and L, we call it D in the last slide, to be the characteristic length, then we could sort of write down the dimensions using these quantities of the different terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. For example, the convective inertial term would have units of rho times u times u over L. So we have u, our characteristic velocities, L is a characteristic length scale. So rho u squared over L is an order of magnitude estimate, if you like, of the convective inertial term. The viscous forces here would be proportional to mu times the second derivative of V with respect to X. So in other words, u, mu times U over L squared. The Reynolds number is the ratio of these con inertial forces, convective inertial forces, to the viscous forces. So to see this, um, if we take rho u squared over L divided by mu u over L squared, we get rho mu L over mu, which is the Reynolds number. So for Reynolds numbers much larger than 1, we can see that inertial forces dominate. And for Reynolds numbers much less than one, viscous forces dominate. So that tells us that, for example, uh, when the inertial forces become sufficiently high, turbulence can occur. And that when um, the velocities become slow and the uh, characteristic lengths, such as the diameter of the tube, become very small, then viscosity becomes dominant and the flow is laminar. So low Reynolds number is the situation for blood flow in the small vessels, High Reynolds number is the situation for blood flow in the largest vessels. So this is our brief introduction to the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, we briefly derived solutions for two well-known problems, the channel flow and the closely related tube flow. And we saw that the Reynolds number was a measure of the ratio of the convective inertial forces to the viscous forces. Therefore, it's a dimensionless quantity and it's useful, among other things, for uh, determining whether a flow may be close to turbulence. And we discussed how in the circulation under most conditions, uh, the Reynolds number is below the transitional Reynolds number and blood flow in most of the circulation is laminar.
In the circulation, the Reynolds number varies from about 4,000 in the largest vessels to about 0.001 in the microcirculation. And this means that in the very largest vessels and in the heart, uh, the flow can be turbulent, but in most of the circulation, the flow is laminar. And whereas in the large vessels, where the Reynolds number is significantly greater than one, the convective inertial forces dominate the viscous forces, in the small vessels and the microcirculation and arterioles, the Reynolds number is much less than one, and the viscous forces dominate the convective inertial forces. One way to view the Reynolds number is to derive the Navier-Stokes equations in dimensionless form. So we can non-dimensionalize by introducing the dimensionless variable xi prime as xi divided by the characteristic length l, vi prime as vi divided by the characteristic mean velocity u, p prime as the pressure p divided by rho times u squared, and t prime, the dimensionless time, as t times u over l. Rewriting then the Navier-Stokes equations in these dimensionless variables, we can get del v prime i tilde t prime plus vk prime del vi prime del xk prime equals minus del p prime del xa prime plus mu over rho u l del 2 vi prime del xk prime del xk prime plus bi times l over u squared. Here we've collected all the constants together in these two terms and you'll see that this constant here is in fact just the inverse of the Reynolds number which is rho u l over mu. So the dimensionless form of the Navier-Stokes equations has del vi prime del t prime plus vk prime del vi prime del xi prime equals minus del p prime del xi prime plus one over the Reynolds number times the viscous term del 2 vi prime del xk prime del xk prime plus one over nfr, which is u squared over bi times l. This quantity here, nfr, is called the Froude number and is a measure of the magnitude of the convective inertial forces to the body forces. So we've, by deriving a dimensionless form of the Navier-Stokes equations, we determine this new dimensionless variable. The dimensionless form of the continuity equation is just del vi prime del xi prime equals zero. And this kind of dimensional analysis is very common and useful in fluid mechanics. As an exercise, you can take the solution for laminar tube flow and prove that the Reynolds number is equal to 2q dot over pi nu r, where r is the resistance and nu is the kinematic viscosity. If the Reynolds number is high enough, the flow can be turbulent. How high the Reynolds number needs to be in order for the flow to be turbulent depends somewhat on other factors. It can vary between 2,000 to as much as 40,000. Uh, some of the factors that the Reynolds number does not account for include the surface roughness. So the rougher the surface, the higher the likelihood of eddies forming and turbulence is being created. Another determinant is unsteady flow. Uh, the transitional Reynolds number is higher in an accelerating flow because turbulence takes time to develop. Uh, on the other hand, it's lower in a decelerating flow, which is less stable. In the circulation, the transitional Reynolds number at which turbulence occurs is approximately 2,300. Now, the highest Reynolds number in the circulation can be 4,000, which suggests that there are parts of the circulation where turbulence is seen. One place is in the flow around the valves and in the ventricles, uh, but even there you find that the flow quickly returns to lamina. Here we see 
4D phase contrast visualizations done with magnetic resonance scan of blood flow patterns uh, in human left ventricle in the outflow tract region of the left ventricle. And you can see this flow is fairly laminar as it gets accelerated out of the ventricles. So the flow swirls around in the ventricles and is turbulent, uh, but quickly uh, restabilizes uh, in the outflow tract as it accelerates out through the valve. However, in a patient with uh, an obstruction to the outflow tract, now the diameter of that flow is narrower, the speed is higher, the, the Reynolds number is higher, and consequently the outflow tract flow is turbulent. Turbulence is also seen uh, on the downstream sides of the heart valves. And another place where turbulence is seen is downstream of a severe narrowing of arteries or stenosis. This is also the situation that the doctor creates when he or she measures your blood pressure using sphygmomanometry. As the pressure in the cuff is increased, the vessels get narrowed by the pressure to the point where no flow occurs. The flow is completely obstructed. Then as the pressure is relieved, uh, a jet flow will go through the narrowing and as that jet flow decelerates coming out of the stenosis, it's destabilized and a critical Reynolds number is achieved that results in turbulence. That turbulence causes the vessel walls to vibrate and that's what the doctor hears with the uh, stethoscope. Another useful uh, dimensionless variable is the Stokes or Wormersley number, which is used to characterize a pulsatile flow. Stokes took the ratio of the transient inertial force rather than the convective inertial force in the case of the Reynolds number to the viscous forces. If omega is the dominant frequency of the pulsatile flow, then we can come up with a dimensional expression for the transient inertial force, which is mass times acceleration or density times omega times u. So you'll see that that has units of mass times acceleration per unit volume. Now, if we take the ratio of this transient inertial force to the viscous force, we obtain rho omega u over mu u over L squared, which simplifies to rho omega L squared over mu or omega L squared over nu, the kinematic viscosity. And this quantity is known as the Stokes number. So now we have a third dimensionless quantity. The square root of the Stokes number, alpha or NW, is L times the square root of omega over nu and is known as the Wormersley number. And this is the more common version of the Stokes number that's used in biomechanics thanks to the work in the 50s of Wormersley uh, studying pulsatile blood flow. In the circulation, omega would be the heart rate and L would be the vessel radius.